Well, a warm welcome to this talk. I'm going to start off by looking at the changing presentation of COVID-19. The signs and the symptoms are changing. Two reasons for this. One is the development of immunity in the population, largely through vaccines, but also partly due to natural infection, which has generated a degree of immunity. So the immunity is one change, but there's also, of course, been a change in the variants that we're suffering from. So originally it was the wild type that first came to this country. Then, then of course, we had the Kent UK mutation now called the Alpha variant. And then we had the India variant now called the Delta variant. And these are causing changes in the signs and symptoms and perhaps a combination of the uh, the, the variation in the uh, in the variants themselves and immunity, these things are interacting. So it's important to know the symptoms of change. Now let's look at these, all based on the uh, COVID symptom tracker app data. Uh, it's all there. It's a little frustrating in uh, lacking in detail in some parts because the, the papers aren't published yet. These are provisional reports, but let, let's dive straight into that now. So new top five COVID symptoms. This was updated on the 23rd of June. Now it's, uh, I'm not sure if it's the 25th or 26th actually, it's late in the 25th I think. Right now the first thing is it's different after vaccination. So after someone's had two vaccines, two vaccine doses and they've had three weeks for them to work, they get fewer symptoms are reported over a shorter period of time, way less ill, less likely to become ill. But people that do get symptoms, the symptoms tend to be of chorizal nature. Um, in other words, it's more like they're getting a common cold. So they might just feel they've got a cold. Now, this is important to realise because someone with two vaccines, very, very unlikely to get ill. They feel they've got a cold. They go to work. They could infect people, perhaps younger people or unvaccinated people who are at greater risk. So it's important to realise that the symptoms have changed so we can get isolate till we can get tested. So we've got basically different clinical criteria for getting tested now. So headache is the most common after two vaccines, then runny nose, then sneezing, then sore throat, then others after that. Now we can see that these are mostly common cold type symptoms. Now I think what's happening here is that there's quite a lot of immunity in, in the body, in the systems of the body, but the virus is getting into the mucous membrane, so it's causing the runny nose and the sneezing and the sore throat. Um, it, the, the headache, of course, is a systemic effect, but this virus has always had headache as a common feature, so that does seem to be maintained. So they're the clinical features after two vaccines. Uh, persistent cough, which used to be common, is now the eighth most common symptom. The loss of smell, which used to be common, the anosmia, is now the 11th most common. And fever is not occurring very often. That's the 12th most, most common. Shortness of breath, 29th most common. Remember, these is, this is in people with two vaccine doses. But doubly vaccinated people should get tested if they have features because, as we've said, uh, the risk that they are passed on to others. Now, um, slight change in the symptoms after one vaccine. If someone's had one vaccine, so this is normally a combination of one vaccine plus the Delta variant. So headache, most common, then runny nose, then sore throat. Uh, sneezing is the fourth on that one and persistent cough is there on that on after one vaccine. So persistent cough is a feature after one vaccine. So that's the difference there between uh, two vaccines those clinical features and uh, one vaccine, these clinical features here. So inter interesting difference. And uh, of course, in the early stages of the pandemic, really, if you'd had those, you wouldn't think that was COVID at all. We used to think that runny noses and th sore throats were not characteristic at all. It's now changed. Right, people that are unvaccinated, what clinical features are they getting? Well, again, headache is the most common then sore throat, then runny nose, then fever, and then persistent cough if they're unvaccinated. So we are seeing a change in the in the symptoms and the presentation of the condition. And I think this is quite really important to know about. Now, people that are unvaccinated, 
And really, this is a bit hard to explain. Presumably, it's just because there's different strains of the virus. The anosmia, the lo loss of smell in the unvaccinated, is now the ninth, and the shortness of breath is now the 30th most common feature, even in people that are unvaccinated. So there you go. It's changed quite a bit. And the uh, the people who on the COVID symptom tracker app, Tim Spector's team, indicating that symptoms as recorded previously are changing with the evolving variants of the virus and as we've said the interaction of immunity as well so i thought that was um well worth knowing about this is still not reflected in the nhs official app believe it or not uh, and it's not really reflected in the mainstream media either so be aware of that i think that's really quite useful now, I think I've got a bit of time left on this video, so I think I'm going to tell you about the new ivermectin study. And this is it here. It's part of the principal trial, which is the Oxford University run trial. Now, as far as I remember, they were going to do this back in February and it simply never happened. It just sort of died a death and went quiet. But it's been well and truly resurrected now, which, of course, is is excellent news now. Um, ivermectin to be investigated in adults over the age of 18 part of the principal trial uh, platform randomized trial for treatment in the community for epidemic and pandemic illness <laughs> that's where they get the principal from right okay uh, that, that's the website there that we're looking at specifically which is the one i've just shown you part of the university of oxford Investigating treatments for people at more risk of serious forms of COVID-19. So they're looking at people with more serious forms of COVID-19 in the community. Now, so far, they've recruited 5,106 individuals. Now, I think that is still the case because, yes, it is, because it gives you a live uh, update on this on this website here, which, of course, is useful. It's probably only updated every 24 hours or so. Um, I haven't now. Th th these are direct quotes from this study, uh, sort of a uh, intro. Um, I don't think it's on this one. It's on. It's on the. It's on the other link I've put. I've pasted there. It's on uh, that link there. Now this is interesting because they're stating these things in italics here as direct quotes, as as, as basically accepted facts. And uh, th this is direct quotes. Ivermectin is a safe, broad-spectrum antiparasitic drug which is in wide use globally to treat parasitic infections. And they say it has known antiviral properties. There's no debate about that from this. Small pilot studies show that early ad administration with ivermectin can reduce viral load and the duration of symptoms in some patients with COVID-19. So the studies that show it can reduce uh, viral load and the duration of symptoms. And of course, we've looked at information yesterday that suggests it does a, a lot more than that. But we're only going by what this says now. And of course, this is direct quotes from the principal trial. You know not to take any drugs based on anything I say. Um, Nuffield Department of Primary Healthcare Science, part of the University of Oxford. Professor Chris Butler, Joint Chief Investigator. Direct quotes from Professor uh, Butler now. Ivermectin is readily available globally and it's dirt cheap, which is brilliant. It has been in wide use for many other infectious conditions, so it's a well-known medicine with a good safety profile. Well, this is a direct quote from Professor Butler. And because of the early promising results in some, some studies, it is already being widely used to treat COVID-19 in several countries, notably Indonesia recently, I think. By including ivermectin in a large-scale trial-like principle, we hope to generate robust evidence to determine how effective the treatment is against COVID-19. Can't argue with that. And whether there are benefits or harms associated with its use. So direct quotes from Professor Butler all makes perfect sense and that's going to be a randomized controlled double blind trial as far as we know treatment group is going to get a three-day course of oral ivermectin so that's the experimental group or the treatment group the control group is going to get standard nhs care and i would imagine 
they're going to take placebo tablets as well to make those two groups as similar as possible. Then of course this group will be compared with that group and that group will be compared with that group to see what the difference is. So this is the independent variable giving the oral ivermectin. This is the control or the placebo group, which I expect to be given a placebo. The dependent variable will how much people get better, how much viral load is reduced. So that makes perfect sense. Now, I understand. I understand that the dose that's going to be given of ivermectin is 0.3 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So that, that means I would be taking something like 25 milligrams as a slightly overweight adult. Um, so that is a reasonable dose. Now, you might remember that the, the dose is normally 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 milligrams per kilogram. So they've kind of gone for the middle dose there, which does seem reasonable. Three days shortish course, but, you know, it, it's what it is. Uh, that doesn't sound too unreasonable. And the trial is supported by a vast network of health and care professionals in care homes, pharmacies, NHS 111 OBS hospitals and more than 1,400 GP practices across England, West Scotland, Northern Ireland. So the Oxford University people with the principal trial are well interconnected, which of course is absolutely brilliant. So that is actually starting now. Now, the inclusion criteria... Um, they want people, if I give you the screen, uh, they want you've been experienced COVID-19 symptoms for 14 days. So you've just started it 14 days or less and you're over age 65. So in a higher age, in a higher risk group or you're aged 18 or over with an underlying health condition. So these are people that are more at risk of serious illness. Or you are aged over 18, you are aged 18 or over with breathlessness associated with COVID-19. So um, again, that would be indicating presumably people that are getting sicker. Now, as well as that, the principal trial is currently investigating an antiviral, favipavir, favipavir uh, as an antiviral as well, but now it's in Introducing ivermectin. Now, whether there's going to be comparison between favipamir and ivermectin, I don't think there is. There could be. Um, but as far as I know, that's not the case. It's going to be ivermectin versus standard care and favipamir versus standard care. Um, but we will, we will see. Um, previous studies in the principal trial have been well conducted. Um, now, of course, um, there's less people getting severe COVID-19 now, thankfully, <laughs> thankfully. So that means it might take quite a bit of time for these results to come through. But it's it's good to see that this is being done. And I think just for the heck of it, we'll watch. Let's watch the uh, let's watch the video. And then this video will be finished. Become a hero from home and join the search for COVID-19 treatments. COVID-19 has affected the lives of everybody. Finding safe and effective treatments that can help people recover at home has been the drive of researchers at the University of Oxford. And right now, you have an opportunity to help by joining the principal trial. We're looking for people with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 to take part in a UK-wide COVID-19 treatment trial called Principal. To be eligible, you will need to be aged 65 years and over or aged 18 to 64 years and either experiencing shortness of breath as part of COVID-19 illness or with certain underlying health conditions. You will also need to be experiencing symptoms that are likely to be caused by COVID-19 and have had them for 14 days or less. Taking part is easy. There are no face-to-face -face visits involved and the trial can be joined online or over the phone from your sofa with a participant pack courier directly to you at home. You will receive a symptom diary, a COVID-19 home test kit, and you may receive a treatment to take in the comfort of your own home. Join the Principal Trials heroic volunteers in the search for COVID-19 treatments by visiting www.principaltrial.org. Principal, the world's largest trial of COVID-19 treatments for recovery at home.
Become a hero from home and join the search for COVID-19 oh, stop. treatments. Stop, stop, stop. I bet you're glad we don't play music on my videos. It's so annoying, isn't it? I just don't see the point of it. Anyway, um, I think that I think that's interesting. Um, you know, if, if this is proved to be effective, you know, the the the, the inhaled uh, steroids were, were approved on the principal trial, which is now part of treatment, and that the, the um, governments around the world will probably accept the results of this trial, where they don't accept the results of uh, meta-analysis. So. Um, I think it is really remarkably promising, and if it, if it works for um, SARS coronavirus too, as as we certainly believe it will, will it work for other viruses as well? The, the, the idea of a cheap generic antiviral is just such a such a, a wonderful uh, a wonderful prospect. Okay, so that is us changing symptoms and new trials. Always more to learn. Um, Yep, I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for watching.